Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Then we'll end up back in Nahum again, in case you want to mark that, because it may take us a while to find it. Nahum is where we're going to end up. But in Deuteronomy chapter 28, I want to begin at verse 16. And we're going to continue on this thought tonight. America, art thou better? America, art thou better than Nineveh? America, art thou better than Sodom? America, art thou better than Jerusalem? All these countries, all these nations, all these major cities that at one time came to the very time with God that enough was enough. Then God asked the question through the prophet Nahum, Art thou better Nineveh than, than no, the city that was in Egypt that was an invincible city? that was totally annihilated and wiped off the map. God said, are you better than that? Do you think I won't judge a nation? Do you think I won't judge a people? I won't re-preach all of this morning's part, but just some of you that weren't here, and, to, and the highlight of it and to recap it is only what God had spoke to me, woke me up during the night earlier in the year, and then gave me two dreams back to back that told me that there would be something said that had been said in secret in the White House, and it went public on May the 9th when our President of the United States announced that he and his administration, Biden had announced it the day before, the administration of America, the highest position, the most powerful man on planet Earth in a natural sense, announced that same-sex marriage is what he believes in. Defiance against God and his word has now brought God's judgment upon this nation. As I said this morning, it will come in catastrophic events in these coming months. This next 12 months, if we stay here that long as a believer, be all right with me if he takes us out tonight. But I can tell you that God's going to answer our administration, and they're not going to like how he answers. Because I can tell you, God spoke to your pastor. America, art thou better. Father, I love you tonight. If ever I've needed you, I need you now. If ever I needed your anointing and the wisdom and the mind of God to speak as your oracles. Heavenly Father, don't let me say anything that you're not saying. But let me speak for you without fear and without favor. Because I know when you unction it by the Holy Ghost, the, the God of heaven will honor and stand behind your word. I pray tonight that people that hear this message, this morning's and tonight, that hear that CD, let it be a life-changing experience. Whoever they might be, let them fall on their knees before it's too late and cry out for mercy. I ask it in your name. Amen. Before I start in the scripture, as we left off this morning, we uh, left off in, out of Daniel chapter 9, and I thought it was very uh, interesting how that, that verse in 9-11, Daniel 9-11 and verse 12, Daniel actually says, Israel, we are now cursed. We have now, as a, a, a nation, have fulfilled Moses' warnings of a curse. And he uses Moses' name. And he said, we have now see that we have arrived at the fulfillment of that curse. And that word curse in Daniel 9, 11, if you look that word curse up in the Strong's Concordance, in the Hebrew pronouncing that word curse there, the Hebrew pronoun pronouncing of that is Allah, A-W-L-A-H. I'm not saying it's Islam. I'm just saying the pronunciation of that curse is Allah. That would be very interesting, especially when it happened in Daniel 9, 11. It was Islam 
that took us by surprise. It was Islam that declared war on America. And now we have a Muslim president. Whether you know it or not or believe it, he is a Muslim. And if he gets this tape, I'm not afraid. He is a Muslim. Okay, so we'll, we'll car carry it on from there. If this nation is now under a curse, then I can tell you, if you look at that word Allah, that it's very fitting that it happened on 9-11. Deuteronomy, now we're going to look. What is a curse? We're going to look at 12 curses. I just picked out 12. There's plenty more. But I picked out 12 that are perfectly fitting of, to prove that America is cursed. Amen. Verse 16. Cursed shall thou be in the city. Cursed shall thou be in the field. Verse, verse 16 is telling us that a curse is when your cities are cursed, when your fields are cursed. I ask us tonight, our cities are war zones. Our schools, our teachers are molesting our students our, with murder and drugs in our schools. Sex is at an all-time high, starting in the fourth and the fifth grade. I ask you tonight, do you think that the, the cities in America are cursed? Verse 17, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store a curse on your economy our bank bailouts our shopping centers are closing our malls are closing our farms and our crops are housing we can see that our economy has been cursed if you owned a house five years ago it could have been worth four hundred thousand Today, at best, it's worth 200000 the same house. There are shopping centers all over this nation that are totally abandoned. Totally abandoned. There are malls that are totally abandoned. If you haven't got out of Chino, I can tell you, I've been across this country. And I'm gonna, I can promise you tonight that the shopping centers and the malls, it's amazing how many stores are still vacant. Just over here on Schaefer and, and the corner of Schaefer and Euclid where the Stater Brothers is, they built, I don't know how many storefronts. How many years now? Four, five, six years? Every one of them set there empty today. They've never been rented. Is America cursed in her economy? I think so. Verse 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. What's he saying? A curse on a nation is cursed is the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, meaning your trade markets that we sell to other nations. Everything you buy today says made in China, made in Japan, Thailand, whatever, Vietnam, wherever they are. What is that saying? That everything you buy today is made out of the country. Instead of us selling to them, they are now selling to us. What does that mean? That we are cursed in our own market trading. Think about it. Verse 19 and 20. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke in all that thou settest thy hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly. Because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. This curse in the verse 18 and 19 is upon your foreign negotiators. Confusion, he says, shame will rest upon you. Think about it tonight. Every foreign policy that we have now is a joke according to all the other nations. 
whatever policy we work, they'll, they'll slap us in the face, do whatever they want. Why? Our policy, as far as America, is a joke. You remember some, what, 30 years ago, or, or maybe a little bit longer, when uh, Gaddafi, I think it was, did what he did over there in, in that Middle East, and President Reagan put a missile in his back pocket. He said, we're not playing any games. We've come here to tell you this is the way it's going to be. I can tell you they saluted whatever you want, Mr. President. We've lost our power. We've lost our ability. We have no negotiating power. Our negotiations are a joke. Think about it. According to, we watch it as they, they no longer respect the U.S. anymore. We have no policy. We'll change with whatever the environment demands. We mock Israel behind their back, yet it goes public. We make a deal with Russia privately, yet it goes public, and nobody cares. Can you imagine the President of the United States telling our Benjamin Netanyahu one thing, and then behind the scenes saying, I'm sick of dealing with him myself. He makes me sick, or he gets on my nerves, whatever it was. But he mocks Israel. He reaches over and grabs a man's hand of, of Russia and says, when I go back in office, I'll have more flexibility. And the man said to him, I'll tell Mr. Putin. He told Mr. Putin, we just had another meeting. Mr. Putin said, I got more important things to do than to go to America for your meeting. You know what he's saying? I don't have to respect nothing you say. To think we were once the most feared nation on planet Earth. We now have a joke for our policies. Do you think we're cursed? Verse 21 and verse 22. The Lord shall make thy pestilence cleave unto thee until he has consumed thee from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with a sword and with blasting and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Drop down to verse 27. The Lord will smite thee with a botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, blindness, astonishment of heart. Down to verse 35. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore, a botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Are you hearing me? What's he saying? The plagues, the incurable diseases have overtaken our nation tonight. Most doctors are not interested in healing you or curing you. They want you on prescribed drugs to treat you, not to heal you. Why? Money, money, money. Have you noticed how many doctors today are foreigners? Did you know that that's a curse? They don't care about you. They want to make money on you. The minute you walk in, they'll, they, before they can even check you, they're going to give you some kind of prescription and, and put you on something that you're going to be on the rest of your life. Just this recent story that it happened with somebody connected and part of this church. A man went to, to a certain man to, to be checked by an American man or whatever, but he's being checked to find out they had this man, the doctors did, on 17 drugs. He was crippled, couldn't walk, rode around in a wheelchair. I believe that's what the story was. 17 different drugs. The man checked him and said, my God, you don't need none of those. 
You don't need any of them. It'll take me time to get you off of them. Three weeks later, he walks in that, that man's office totally well as far as his body in recovery. What's going on? They don't care. We don't care. We want you incurable. We don't want you healed. We want you back here on some kind of medication. My God, you heard me say it. The side effects is enough to scare me to death. Yet they don't care. You know why? It's part of a curse. There have never been more people in, the, in this nation than right now that are on high blood pressure medicine. They're on cholesterol medicine. When the number one thing about cholesterol, it's good for you. It's part of your own need of your own body. All of our forefathers never knew what cholesterol was, and I still couldn't spell it. But I can tell you tonight, it's not a cholesterol pill you need. I walked into a vitamin store with Brother McGee there in, in Whitney, Texas. We walked in a vitamin store, and, and uh, Curtis was talking to the lady that run the store. We were just going back and forth. Said a woman come in, a truck driver, and said, I, I can't hold a wheel no more. My arms are falling off. The pain, it's just agony and pain. I hurt from my head to my toes, and I, I can't take no more. I'm only in my early 50s. The woman that run the vitamin store said to her, are you on cholesterol medicine? She said, yes. She said, that's your problem. She said, all you need is CoQ10. Just a little bit of nutrition is all you need. He said that the entire side effects of cholesterol medicine will make you hurt from your elbows to your, to your knuckles of your toes. I'm telling you tonight, saints, we, we've got to realize it's a curse. When that doctor tells you, I'm not here to heal you. I'm here to put you on something. I'm here to make money on you. Billions of dollars are being spent tonight by Americans because we cannot get cured. And I can tell you, God created this body to heal itself. If it'll walk with God, talk with God, the healing will manifest. But the curse to a nation is to put you on medications. Remember Brother Clendenin used to tell the story. He opened an, an old folks, I guess they called it back then, an old folks home that, that brought in all the elderly people. He said they come in, they're slobbering, their heads down on their chest. He said they don't know where they're at. He said it's unbelievable the mess they were in. He said the first thing we did as our church and our staff, we got them off of the meds. And when we did, they started worshiping God. They started clapping. They started running around the building. I might, can I tell you tonight, saints, the curse of a plague and the incurable is from foreign doctors. Go back to verse 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder, and dust from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. What does that mean? Droughts. We have family-owned farms in America right now, been owned for a hundred years by the same families. They are now shut down. They can't even make a living on their own thousand-acre farms. How do you know, preacher? Number one, you see it here on the news, but number two, I just drove 3,000 miles across this country, farm after farm after farm. In fact, Brother Nick will tell you, more of them are closed and shut down than there are in operation why we're cursed there's a drought you can farm all you want and you can't even produce enough money our dairy farmers right now in america southern california most of their dairies many of them are going bankrupt because the cost of feed and to keep the dairy open the milk will not pay back what it was for a profit and now they're going bankrupt it's a curse Isn't this amazing? America, art thou better? Art thou better? You remember when we were kids? We had a cash and carry drive-through dairy store almost in every city. 
busiest little places you've ever been to in your life. Come running out there. What do you need? Two half gallons of, of milk, half gallon of chocolate, and half, half gallon of fruit punch. What else do you need? Your popsicles? All right. That little store, every one of them. Rockview Dairy had them on every city and every corner. Today they set boarded up. Why? It's exactly what I'm talking about. It's a drought. It's a curse. Verse 25 and 26. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and you're going to flee seven ways before them. Thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, and thy carcass shall be meat unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. What does this mean? The curse on a nation is your enemies will put your armies to flight, to chase. Let me tell you tonight, saints, what a joke Islam has made of the United States of America. We don't even know who our enemies are. Maybe it's because we have a Muslim president. He's just doing what Muslims do. Muslims hate, Islam hates America. So all they've done is make America Muslim. Don't get mad at me, I'm telling you the truth. Everywhere you see a mosque, the bottom line to that mosque means we now have conquered that very area or region that that mosque went up. We own it. They declared jihad, a war, Islam against America, and they haven't stopped. They made a joke out of us. They're mocking us in Afghanistan. In, they're mocking us in Iraq. I said, we went in and helped them. Eliminate Saddam Hussein. I said, and we lost or paid billions to make that happen. I said, I'd say, Iraq, you got gold, you got oil, pay us back. We don't do anything for free. Set you free and then you make a joke out of us. Hello. What a game we're playing in Afghanistan. What a game we've played in all the last several different wars we've been involved in. Just little games that we play that we end up running for our life. President went into office. The first week he's in office, he went to Egypt to privately tell them. We had people that we know personally that was in that meeting. He basically was apologizing to them for America and its arrogance. Are you kidding me? I said, are you kidding me? They brought our twin towers down. They're telling us we were going for the White House. We were going for the uh, every part of America. We were going to destroy the very foundation of this nation. They are Muslim. They're Islam. They have no agenda other than to wipe us out. Takes you 45 minutes to get through the checkpoints at an at airport when really all you need to know are you a Muslim? Are you from, from that world that produces them? Are you a Muslim? Then we're profiling. Hallelujah. I know you may not like what I'm saying, but I'm telling you the truth. But since we're cursed, our enemies are making a joke out of us. We bankrupt our nation for one reason. It's because of the security we had to produce after 9-11. I know I've traveled all over this world. I go in an airport before 9-11. I walk straight to the gate. My wife could walk to the gate with me. Tell me bye. Cut, hug me and kiss me bye. Have a Coke. Have a bottle of water. Now you throw away all your water. Go through the gate. Buy another bottle for three fifty. dollars It takes you an hour to get through the checkpoints. 30, 40 people are now doing what one used to do. Why? We're cursed. Islam hates America. So all they've done is make America Muslim. And they're not going to stop till they accomplish their agenda. You hear me. Let's go to verse 30 for number 8. Thou, thou shalt betroth a wife... And another man shall lie with her. 
Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and thou shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Do you read, are you reading this? That's a curse. What's he saying? Divorce, broken homes, broken marriages. For over 50% of the so-called Christians are getting divorces tonight. Our percentage of divorce in the evangelical church is equal to the world's. Why? It's a curse. Do we not know, saints, it's a curse? It's judgment. Do we not care? Do we not fear? Has the curse robbed us of the fear of God? Just get rid of him. Get rid of her. Do whatever you want. Leave a church pew. Throw your marriage in a trash bin. Who cares what God says? It's a curse. And part of that curse is not to fear God no more. Verse 31. Thine ox shall be slain before your own eyes. Thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face. And shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies. And thou shalt have none to rescue them. Understanding here is Moses is passing down this curse. The only way of living, sheep, asses, goats, the only way was farming. They didn't have any other means to raise or to have an income. So what's he saying? That in bankruptcies, you, you will find your livelihood violently taken away from you. Unemployment is at an all-time high. What a joke we make out of figures. Oh, it's back. We're, we're back. We're on recovery now. And everybody I meet, pray that I get a job. My company's gone broke. My company's going to be laying off. Pray that they don't lay me off. What is this? The bankruptcies. The setbacks of our means of life and livelihood. He said the curse is it will be violently taken away from you. Do you realize how many people worked in the Twin Towers? How many people went unemployed as well as losing their own life that the next day there's no building to go to, there's no property to go to? I'm only giving you an isolated incident. I'm talking about saints across this country. The, the, the unbelievable loss of, of jobs and companies and bankruptcies. What is it? Saints of God, hear this preacher. It's bankruptcies. It's our livelihood. It's violently being taken away from us. Verse 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. My God. Thine eyes shall look and fall and fail with longing for them all the day long. There shall be no might in thine hand. There's nothing you can do about it. What is this curse? It's a loss of an entire generation. Hear me tonight. A curse on a nation is a loss of an entire generation. We've watched unsaved, new age, immoral people take our children away from us. They now teach them that God's word doesn't matter. God's opinion is no different than man's opinion. Did you know that? They teach it in our schools. You have a right to your opinion. You have a right freedom of choice. Don't let nobody dictate to you. And what did we do? We let our school system rob us of a generation. You would get swats when I was in junior high and high school if they caught you not saluting the flag. If you didn't repeat that ever morning, that, you know, the 
flag of allegiance, the pledge of allegiance. If you, if you got caught not making it, you would maybe write, I will pledge allegiance to the flag a thousand times or take three swats. Now if you even attempt to tell a kid that I'm going to make you do something, mom's there, the, everybody else comes down, what are they doing? They're taking those kids out of our hands and telling them, I'll teach them. Well, the most horrifying statements I have to make, 96% of our kids in evangelical churches that go off to college, 96% of them never go to church again the rest of their life. What does that say? That college is anti-Christ. It's new age. It's robbed us of a generation. Because they're not teaching you fundamentals and trades. They're teaching you a mind control, preparing you for the mark of the beast. Save this earth. Save Mother Earth. I've never seen a worse in my life generation that's so in love with animals. My God, they can't walk a dog no more. They got to walk six of them. They're running everywhere. They're going all over the place. Trying to walk them, picking up behind them. My God, what a mess. Mess it is. Got to pick that up. Everything is what? We'll come walking, carrying their little doggy. He's licking their face, sitting in their lap. They're driving down the freeway. You don't know which one's driving. The dog's looking around. Went to a cafe, little drive through today for lunch. A truck was going through, had a dog with his head out the window. I said, I wonder what he's ordering. I'll take a Bow Wow burger. And, and I can tell you they'll feed that dog better than they'll eat. Why? We've lost a generation. We've taught them in our schools to serve the creature. Serve yourself. And we cursed ourselves. Are you listening to me? We have literally cursed ourselves by watching 96% of our college kids that leave our churches and go off to school never darken a church door again. My God, I think of the, the precious ones we have been known and connected to that went off to school and left God out. Born and raised, walked with God, knew God. What's going on? The success is in that school, not in the church. Think about it. It's now, what do you think? If it feels good, do it. Don't let mom and dad, the church, nobody tell you what to do. Drugs, sex, violence. You just do it any way you want to do it. Help yourself. My grandkids tell me stuff. It goes on in that school. I said, my God, you got to be kidding me. you got to be kidding me. Think about it. Boys don't even know how to wear their pants no more. They're clear down here. I don't want to look at that septic tank. My God. No toilet's ever been inviting to me. What an awful place. We stopped at a Brahms to get an ice cream. Ain't a better ice cream than Brahms. But the guy waiting on us, his pants was clear down here. I thought, oh, God. I'm not going to order none of this chocolate. I was afraid what they'd do to my cone. I'd like to tell him, pull them pants up. Dare you dip me in ice cream, that rear end hanging out. It makes you sick, doesn't it, saints? I said, it makes you sick. Pull them pants up, boys. Be a man. Quit pulling them down over the bottom. You know what the real meaning of that is? I know you heard me say it before. When you wear your pants down there, you're saying, I'm available. You want to know why we're allowing same-sex marriage in the White House? No, dad, be a dad. Mom, be a mom. Pull them pants up. That's right. 
Where, who taught him that? School. You see him walking down the sidewalk trying to hold him up. <laughs> Texting. Listening to something on their headphones. I said, my God, are these warped? What a warped generation. Pitiful. Girls today, they, they don't dress for you to be tempted anymore. There isn't no more temptation. The mystique's gone. Just get a good look. Do whatever you want to do. Think any way you want to think. It's all available. Help yourself. No, I'm not being ugly. I'm just telling you the truth. Who did that? The school. Can I tell you? I know I'm a dinosaur. I know I'm an old fogey. But 45 years ago in school, when the girls got to school, that faculty looked at you. You girls, you young girls, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. And they said, it looks a little short. Laura, get on your knees. And if your skirt didn't touch the ground, go home. I said, skirt. Not your underwear. Most of them go to school now. You can't tell if they got on pants or underwear. Isn't it pitiful? What did that, Pastor? The school system robbed us of a generation. They were cursed. We don't care what we look like. You ruin a good meal when you see some guy come in like that. Even Cracker Barrel doesn't look good when that happens. Go to verse 43. See, I'm only giving you 12 curses out of how many is there in there? I think there's how many? 54 curses? Oh, Lord. We'd be here all night, wouldn't we? Verse 43. The stranger, the foreigner that is within thee shall get above thee very high and now shall come down very low. Who? The foreigner. The foreigner shall rise above you. Other nations are prospering at our expense. China and Japan could bankrupt America in one day. Just look at our towns. Look at our businesses. Look at all of them. They're all foreign run, foreign owned. Stop at any hotel you want to stop at. All foreigners. They own all of our all of our hotels. Our businesses. Little old city Artesia that I was raised in. I was in junior high school, 7,000 people. It was a little country town, really. There's nothing but us rednecks, Mexicans, and all the Dutchmen. That's all it was there. Dairy farms. In fact, Cerritos was called Dairy Valley. That little town. I'm telling you, I don't ever remember in my childhood till I was 18 years old ever locking a door at night. Didn't lock your car. You went to the park when the, the daybreak of day and you didn't come home till it got dark at night and you never had to worry about your kids. Now the city of Artesia, when you enter, it says Little India. Every store in that city is foreign owned and foreign run. The entire real estate market is all foreign run. Go to Westminster, it's a little Vietnam. Go over here, Chinatown. Go over here, little Tokyo. Go over here, all the different places. What's going on? The stranger, the foreigner inside your country will rise up above you and bring you down. It's a curse. I said, it's a curse. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And the Bible is right. Verse 44. This is number 12. He shall lend to thee. The foreigner will. He'll lend to thee. And thou shall not lend to him. He shall be the head. And thou shall be the tail. That means rear end. That means they're at the top and we're at the bottom. Isn't it amazing? You go now to a restaurant, takes you 45 minutes to order because you can't understand them and they can't understand you. 
Almost have to have an interpreter in America to order bacon and eggs. Why? They've rose up to take this nation. No, I'm not speaking prejudice. I'm trying to tell you we're cursed. Now you go through the, back to the south and you'll see a sign out in front of an old hotel. Looks like something from the 30s or 40s. And it says a big old sign out there. American owned and American run. Some old cowboy sitting out there in a chair. He's in charge of that hotel. Ain't no foreigner taking over my hotel. There's only one or two of them left. You hearing me? A debtor nation, not a lending nation. Saints, we're not only in debt, but we're in debt to the tune of almost, I heard it last week, 16 trillion dollars. Do you know what a trillion dollars is? Me either. Marissa, show it to him, will you? A trillion dollars. You can spend one million three hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars nine hundred and fifty-three dollars and fifty cents each day for two thousand years, and you spent a trillion dollars. Hello. One trillion dollars stacked on top of each other will circle the earth three times. I'd like to have a little spending money, wouldn't you? One trillion dollar bills laid end to end would make 16 round trips to Mars. Now, do you know what a trillion dollars is? Listen to your pastor. From George Washington, first president of the United States, 200 and some years later, to George Bush Jr., it took us over 200 years to get to 10 trillion in debt. Yet, saints, in three and a half years, we've gone from 10 trillion to 16 trillion dollars in debt. Took us 230 whatever years to get to 10 trillion, and three and a half years to 16 trillion. Now you know what it cost to get a trillion. Can I tell you, it ain't coming back. The economy's gone forever. The next economy will be the Antichrist, and mine will be on streets of gold. This economy is over. I said it's over. You're not going to see it come back, okay? That's not negative. That's the truth. I just want to help you out with that. So we have gone from 10 trillion to 16 trillion in three and a half years. Do you think America's cursed? from once being the number one nation in the world to lend out to the number one nation in the world in debt? Saints, we repented after 9-11, but with less time than I can tell you, we didn't just go back to business as usual, but we have plunged in 11 short years from 9-11 to a nation that I cannot find in all of my searching from Genesis to Revelation. I can't find a nation that even comes close to what America is now calling normal living. And allowing to take place in the face of Almighty God. The most God-fearing nation on planet Earth has now arrived to who cares what God thinks. America, art thou better than Nineveh? Art thou better than Sodom? Our heritage, our one, uh, one nation under God, our prayer in school is now without the name of Jesus. Our kids being taught it's normal now to have two mommies. It's normal to have two daddies. Is there a bottom? Only when it's too late we will realize we have lost it all. Go to Nahum. I'm just getting started. Not really. 
Go to Nahum. Now this really gets interesting. Nahum chapter 1, verse 2. I was talking to Darren at lunch today. He said, Dad, I've been in, in Iraq in the far north of it. He said, I've been to Nahum's tomb. This old prophet Nahum that we're reading about here said, I've been to his tomb where Nahum was buried. Not far from Assyria or what they used to call Nineveh is where he was buried. Now here's this old prophet. Verse 2, he says, God is jealous. What's happened? Nineveh is getting its fi final call, its last invitation from God or declaration from God. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for who? His enemies. Aren't you glad you're on the Lord's side tonight? The Lord is slow to anger, great in power. He will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind. He's in charge of the tornadoes and in the storms and in the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea. He maketh it dry. He drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth in Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him. Well, that's a God, isn't it? The mountains quake at him. The hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. I'm reading this, but I'm speaking to America. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he'll make an utter end of the place thereof. And darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you imagine? What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Let's stop there. What's he saying? America has repeated the Nineveh disaster. We have followed the same pattern we imagine whatever we want to imagine. And we tell God we don't care what he thinks. We've repeated Nineveh's pattern. And now it's a final message. That verse 9 he says, making it very clear. What do you imagine against the Lord? He'll make an utter end affliction. Shall not rise up the second time. We've used that for healing. But the real context of that is, Nineveh, you'll never, never afflict another person or nation. Because I'm going to wipe you out. I'm going to wipe you off the very map. Nineveh, I'm going to take care of what you think should not be taken care of. What you don't care and mock me about and decide to call war against me, there will be an end to you and you will never, ever afflict another person. Go to Nahum chapter 3, verse 7. Verse, verse 7. And it shall come to pass 
that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous No, that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, her wall was from the sea, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite, put Lubin were thy helpers, yet was she carried away, she went into captivity, her young children also were dashed in pieces, at the top of the streets, at the head of the streets, they cast lots for her honorable men, and all of her great men were bound in chains. My God, are you listening? America, are we better than Nineveh? Are we better than Sodom? When these cities reach this place that we're at tonight, are we better that God should spare us? We that have been given much, much is required. Which means because of our heritage, we're going to suffer even greater judgment. No empire in the history of mankind, when it reached this place, did God spare it. He wiped it out. When our president and present administration and our president himself announced he believes in same-sex marriage, he all, he's already said he believes in abortions, which is murder. He's already said he believes America is no longer a Christian nation. He may or he may not know it, but he has said to God, I dare you to answer me. I have spoken to the whole world what I think of you, Almighty God, and your word. Let me say something tonight, Mr. President of the United States of America. Art thou better? Put up on that what Newsweek put out last week. Newsweek, last week, the first gay president. I declare to you tonight that are here and that are hearing this tape, you are the last gay president. You're the first and you're the last. You mark this preacher's word. What a joke. What a mockery. What a mockery we've made of God Almighty. Breaks your heart, doesn't it? I said it breaks your heart. We know how God feels about it. We know what God thinks of it. We know what his word says. We watch history show us exactly how God treats nations and, and generations and, and all through history, how God reacts to them, how God handles them. Why would we think God is going to do it any other way? Remember I said God told me several months ago there's a secret going on in that White House. And he said, when that secret is exposed, it's going to be too late. There it is, saints. I think the next main event, if we get there, you're going to see this same man turn his back on Israel and throw them under the bus because he's a Muslim. That's why he's made a pact with Islam. Whether he wants to admit it or not, I'm not afraid to tell you the truth. He's in there for one reason. He is serving as the judgment of God on America. He is to fulfill the judgment on this nation. Not because of his color, but because of his spiritual condition. Because his defiance against God and God's word. I'd say it, I don't care who was up there. If they took that stand and who they are, what they are, or who their mom or dad or grandpa was, I'd say the same thing because that's a defiance to Almighty God. He's told the whole world, in your face, God. He went to George Clooney's house 30 miles from here and told him in a joking way, how'd you like my decision yesterday? My yesterday decision was same-sex marriage. Now, I need your money and your votes. Tell God to march off the pier. No, no, you don't think 
God woke this preacher up long before this ever came out. I had no idea that's what was in this man's heart. I knew that he was an antichrist spirit, but I did not know it went to this depth. But it's gone to this depth. And I declare to you tonight, America, art thou better? Sodom, art thou better? I'm telling you tonight, saints of God, we're headed for, for an appointment with God Almighty. And it's in these coming days and weeks and months. If ever you walked with God in the closest of holiness, you better line it up now and now, if ever you have in your life. Nahum verse th chapter 3, verse 11. Let me read it to you. Thou also shalt be drunken. Thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. What's he saying? He said, Nineveh, because of your destruction and your curse, America, because of your curse, you're drunken. You're drunken with lust. You're drunken with evil. You're drunken with drugs and violence. You're intoxicated with prosperity. Every Christian channel, every preacher on there is intoxicated with prosperity. They have cursed America. They've robbed the church. Christian television has robbed the local church of its numbers, its income, its outreach, its missions, everything. Because you send it all to a Christian channel to keep somebody on the air to tell you that you're looking at a doomsday preacher. Don't listen to him. And when doomsday comes, they're going to say, my God, I, I, th I thought I was right. I thought I was right. No, you ignored every stop sign. God convicted you. God woke you. God dealt with you. God tells everyone that's in hell, I warned you hundreds of times. And he'll tell them the date and the time that he dealt with them, that he wooed them, that he drawed them, that he warned them. You won't go to hell like they said to, this morning. You won't go there because of God just throwing you there. You go there as an intruder. Because God dealt with you time and time and time again. Not a preacher on this planet that's intoxicated with prosperity that God didn't deal with. Long before it got there. That word hid in that verse, it literally means you'll be reduced to nothing. You'll be powerless without an answer. Problems that can no longer be solved. Seeking a refuge and you can't find one. God said, verse 11, you'll be drunken and thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength, refuge because of the enemy. Think about it. Seeking a refuge and can't find one. Our doctors don't know how to help you. So they put you on a variety of drugs, as I said earlier. And they tell you, see you in a month. No cure. No answer. With perplexity. Jesus called it perplexity. Meaning, at the last days, there'll be problems without solutions. That's part of the curse. Our prisons are overcrowded. We're, so we're letting the offender out early. No matter what their offense was, they have no other options. There comes a point when God says, enough is enough. Turn left to Nahum chapter 1, verse 11. Nahum chapter 1, verse 11. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. My God. What's he saying? All of your conspiring, all of your counseling, all of your teaching and all of your planning and all of your plotting has come out that it's against God. In other words, God, I declare war on you. Come out. Come on out. I know you said that murder's wrong. I know you said that abortions are wrong. I know you said homosexuality is wrong. Come out. Come out. He's coming out. He's coming out. He's coming out. 
And when he comes out, the world's going to shake and tremble at God Almighty. The whole world is going to know I'm God. I'm God. There comes a point when God says enough's enough. This is a place when a nation comes to when it is no longer just rejecting God, but it begins to declare war against God. Our judges, our courts, our Supreme Court, our, all of our decision makers are voting against God by throwing God out of every law of our land. But let me tell you who is going to have the last word. Go down to verse 13, Nahum 1, verse 13. For now will I break his yoke from off of thee, and I will burst thy bonds in sunder. Let me tell you who's going to have the last word. Nineveh was so wiped out that it was 2,500 years later. In 1845, excavators found ruins of Nineveh. God wiped it off the map. We may be headed for a nuclear holocaust. I don't know. But I do know one thing. He said, Nineveh, I'll break the back of you. I'll have the last word. I'll have the last say. And when he wiped Nineveh off the map, that was 600 and some years before Christ. And in 1845, they dug up some ruins and they said, wow, this is old Nineveh. God so wiped it out for 2,500 years, you couldn't find a landmark that would give you anything. The only thing that, like Darren said, I went to the tombstone, Nahum. Why? A prophet of God stood up and said, Nineveh, God's had enough. God's had enough. I didn't declare this war. I didn't make this message. God set me up in that bed. And for hours and hours and hours, God Almighty helped me pin these words to bring to this church that not only is a warning, but a mighty preparation for a, a time that you and I can look at what the coming events, the coming catastrophes, and look at them and say, my God, he must be at the door. He must be at the door. This all may come to a martial law. I don't know. This thing's coming apart is all I'm going to tell you tonight. We must realize. Now you say, Pastor, where does that put us? that truly love God and serve God in holiness and fear. As I read earlier this morning, in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, God said, even if Noah, Job, and Daniel were in it, they would deliver their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. Child of God, there's peace and safety in God. I said, there's peace and safety I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed fixed on thee. The angels of the Lord encamp around about them that fear him. There's a protecting hand. 10,000 will fall at one side, 1,000 at the other, but it shall not come nigh thee. Walk with God, child of God. I only, God said, I only deliver the righteous when I bring, when I send my judgment. Yes, we will be affected. <coughs> excuse me, by what we see and hear in this final hour. But child of God, hold on to God's unchanging hand. When he comes, will he find faith on this earth? Yes, our faith is going to be greatly tested. But if you know God, you know his word, no matter what you face or go through, will only make you say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. I'm ready to be found faithful when you come. The greatest days of the church will be in the middle of a world that's fallen apart. The true church is going out of here victorious. Joel prophesied and said, In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. 
Young men see vision. Old men will dream dreams. Servants and handmaids, I'm going to pour out my spirit. The book of Acts, Peter stood up. The same man that said, one day with God is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So Peter, two days ago, you stood up and you said, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. God didn't say, and that was it. No, sir, this is that. What's he saying? I'm going to have a Pentecostal church victorious in the last of the last days. Hallelujah. The church will go out just like it was born. I said the church is going to go out like it was born. I want to tell you tonight, these last couple of years for most of you, including your pastor, have been the most difficult years of your life. Whatever it was, mental, psychological, spiritual, all of it affected you spiritually. And all God was doing, saints, was preparing us, putting us through boot camp, getting us ready for the main event. I told him in Whitney, high school, playing basketball in high school, that coach run us to death. After practice, we practiced for two and three hours. After practice, we'd run on the end line, go to the half court, go back, go to the end, come back, run, run, run. I'd bend over. I thought I was going to die. Finally, I said to him, I said, Coach, what are we doing this running stuff for? We're basketball players. He said, let me tell you something, Duke Downs. He said, when we get into our first game and we go to halftime, when we come back out after halftime, they're going to know we're in shape. They're going to know that you guys ran yourself into getting in shape for that first game of the season. And if we're going to be a championship team, you're going to have to pay the price. You're going to have to be in great shape. I can tell you spiritually, I've caught on. It's a boot camp. Run to that end. Run back. Run. Run up, run back, pay the price, pray through, pay the price, pray through, because God has given us a backbone that says, I can stand in the middle of adversity. I can stand victorious because I'm watching their world come apart. While I get ready to go up, I'm a free man tonight. You think you don't preach, preach mean, you preach hard. I've never been happier in my life because I know tonight I'm in the perfect will of God. If I don't get back to that house, I promise you I'll be in heaven when you get there. I guarantee you. Not a doubt in my mind. That's been taken care of. I'm eternally secure. Not that I preach eternal security. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. This is that. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you tonight, your prayer meetings are going to change. They're going to begin to pray in the Spirit like you've never prayed in the Spirit before. You may pray for 45 minutes in tongues and say five words in English because you're not going to know what to say. You're not going to know what to pray. But the Spirit said, I'll pray through you. I'll pray the mind of God. I'll pray the will of God. I'll pray the purpose of God in you and through you. You'll get up out of that prayer meeting and the whole world's coming apart. All the hell is raging. Everything's coming apart. You'll walk down the street saying, my God, I've never been happy. Here. I've never been more joyful. I've never had more victory. I have peace. Why? I not appointed you to wrath. You're my children. I'll provide for you in a desert. He brought manna in that desert for what? Three million Jews. Put water in that desert. Same God is in this house tonight. I'm a free man, aren't you? I encourage you tonight, from what you heard this morning, what you heard tonight, let that be not a, just a warning, but a preparation. You mean all these boot camp training I've been through was only for now? Yes, sir. You've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
Everybody that quit at the crossroad, everybody that stopped and went back, it, the way got too tough. It got too hard. The trial was too great. And if that's the way God treats his kids, I'm out of here. They'll come back in this last day without a solution, without an answer, can't get a breakthrough, can't get an answer. That you that stayed to your post, that held on to the unchanging hand of God, when the storms are raging, you'll say the same God that brought me through, the same God that took me through across that Jordan. The same God, when they crossed that Jordan, they got halfway across and, jo and Joshua said, stop, gather up 12 stones, gather up them rocks and stones. And here they went, carrying them stones across out of that Jordan. He said, now you pile them up over here on the other side. And when the trials and the storms begin to rage, when the president says same-sex marriage is normal and God can walk off the pier, you walk back over and you look at that testimony, the God that took me across my Jordan, the God that took me through my trial, that took me through my test. I'm looking at my testimony. I'm looking at my breakthrough. I'm looking at my answer God will deliver you hallelujah I'm done I said I'm done choir let's sing I'm free I'm free tonight hallelujah hallelujah get on your feet and shout and praise God tonight I'm free from the fear of tomorrow I'm free from the fear the guilt of the past